Namaste. Welcome to this special episode <laughs> of Yoga Vasishta. I'm doing this because I've gotten some very strange comments from some of our viewers that indicate they really don't get what book one is all about. And maybe they don't even get what Yoga Vasishta is really about. The first thing is, it's called Maharamayana. And it's attributed to uh, Valmiki. But it may not be the same Valmiki. Or it may be Valmiki writing on a whole higher level. So don't mistake it for the kind of religious writings or mythological writings as Ramayana. This is a whole different ballgame. And it's really, uh, how can I say, it's for the connoisseur. It's for the people who are almost realized, or even if they are realized, uh, like me, it's a very good vehicle for teaching. So, with that, I want to take a look at this book one we've been going through. The last few episodes, I, I noticed that the statistics, the viewer uh, responses, very different from the previous material I was going through, even though I was promoting it in exactly the same way. Um, normally, I would get like 30 views or so in the first 24 hours. And with Yoga Vasishta, it's maybe half that. So I'm thinking there has to be something wrong. I started to look into it and contact some of my fans. And guess what I found out? They don't get it. Really, book one is the foundation for success in meditation. Uh, for self-realization. That's really what it's all about. It gives you the platform on which to build. Now, some people wrongly think, they're, they're giving me comments like, Rama's speech is negative, or it's only about external morality, or even it's just preliminary. It's not really about Advaita at all. They're missing the point. They're missing the point because of their own psychological blind spots. And I'm going to explain that in this video very thoroughly. So <laughs> strap yourselves in. Here we go. Book one, Rama's speech, his extended, really, put down of the whole material world and material life is not simply about his own selfish feelings of depression, anxiety, and purposelessness, meaninglessness of life or any of that. He's not alienated. Huh? He's seeing things the way they really are. It's about desirelessness. Rama has come to the point where he sees that this material world and material life in general is worthless, at least in terms of attaining self-realization. And that in order to become enlightened, truly enlightened, one has to give up desire and ego. But that's what it's really about. He's speaking in the way that a person who is beyond desire would naturally speak. It's not that he's negative. It's not that he's down on everybody. He doesn't hate everybody. <laughs> he doesn't hate anything, but he doesn't like anything either. So he's simply speaking from the point of view of someone who has realized the uselessness and futility of material existence. But Vashishta and Vishvamitra the great sages recognize this. And they even state it. Vishvamitra says, This stupor of Rama 
is not caused by any accident or affection. I believe it is the development of that superior intellect which rises from the right reasoning of dispassionate men. So in other words, it's not ordinary depression at all. Or maybe what we call depression isn't really depression. Maybe it's actually realism. So that's where the two schools of thought divide. The transcendentalists see Rama's symptoms as the beginning of self-realization, whereas those who are materialists uh, secretly, <laughs> still conditioned by material thoughts, think that, oh, Rama is just depressed and he's talking negatively like this because he doesn't really understand what's going on. No. No, that's wrong. And I'm going to show you how that's wrong. Vishwamitra goes on to say, After his mental dullness is removed by my reasoning, he will be able to rest in that happy state of mind to which we have arrived. In other words, he will attain complete self-realization. He's that close that all he needs is to hear a little talk. Huh? Well, actually, it becomes 22 days. <laughs> but if someone can become self-realized in 22 days, that's wonderful. That's marvelous. He's very close. So his speech in the beginning is not the speech of an ordinary man. It's the speech of someone who is highly elevated in their minds. It's not someone who's simply depressed and negative. It's someone who is on the verge of complete enlightenment. Desirelessness, egolessness, a lack of caring about the world. So how is it that people are getting it wrong and saying, oh, Rama's speech is just about external things like morality and stuff like that? Well, first of all, maybe they're thinking, it's still the same old Valmiki. It's still the same old Ramayan, but it's not. It's not at all. I think the reason they're talking like that is because Rama's speech makes them uncomfortable. Why? They rationalize that, it's, that they already know this. But in fact, they have not attained the same degree of desirelessness the same degree of egolessness that Rama displays in this speech. So it makes them uncomfortable. It's like, oh, this kid is ahead of me. And uh, so they rationalize it. And they say, oh, it's just preliminary. It's just introductory. It's not the real Yoga Vashishta yet. Uh, that comes later. And they like to quote from book five and book six. But wait a minute. If you have not realized in actual practice, in actual life, what is given in book one, how are you going to understand books five and six? It's not possible. But you see, these people who are talking are the kind of people who studied a lot of books. They read a lot of books, so much books, in fact, that they don't have time to meditate very much maybe an hour in the morning and an hour at night. They don't really practice. Like when I practice, when I go on retreat, I'm sitting 8, 10, 12 hours a day. I think four or five hours is the minimum that it takes to even get warmed up. So I don't think these people have actually got it. And I think they are rationalizing their lack of insight by saying that what Rama is speaking here is just preliminary or it's just external. No. His speech realizes deep insight into the nature of reality. The truth is they can't practice or realize to the same level that Rama is speaking here. So they feel like they have to put him down. They have to defend their, their realization but really, aren't they just defending their egos? Aren't they really just defending their lack of commitment to practice? Aren't they really just trying to rationalize 
how they have been meditating for so many years and they haven't got it yet? I think that's the case. That's more like it. So, oh, I don't need to hear this. I don't need to listen to this Rama's talk. I don't need to think about these issues. They're just external. I'm, I'm realizing the oneness of everything. Come on. If you can't get beyond ego investment and material desire and attachment, how do you expect to realize Brahman? Huh? How do you expect to enter into emptiness and nothingness? Huh? You can't do it. That's the truth. That's why you're speaking against Rama's speech in book one. They're wrongly thinking that they need the ego and they need possessions and attachments. Why? Because they're still involved in mundane activities and sense enjoyment. Now, there's nothing wrong with material activity and there's nothing even wrong with sense enjoyment. But what's wrong is to be attached to these things. To think I am the body, I am the mind, I need these things and I have to have it. There's a whole wrong school of thought about self-realization that says that you can continue with sense enjoyment. You can continue with ordinary activities and still somehow realize self-realization. I don't buy it. It's not my experience. My experience is that to make significant progress towards enlightenment, you have to give up all those things, at least temporarily. At least you have to go on an extended retreat. Uh, like when I retired from business, I went to Kauai in Hawaii and I camped in the jungle for six months. I did nothing but meditate and chant. And finally, I felt like, oh, I'm finally established in sadhana. And it was at that point that I went completely beyond all of the societies and religious organizations I had been involved in previous to that. They couldn't understand where I was at at all. So I became, at that point, an uh, independent sadhu, a law unto myself alone not accepting the authority of any organization or group. And that was the beginning of making real progress in spiritual life. So a person who's ego invested, a person who is attached to possessions and who is engaged in material activities and thinking that this is real, is going to rationalize. He's going to have to distance himself somehow from Rama's insight because Rama's insight transcends their whole game. And it reveals actually their shallowness of mind. People then imagine that, oh, we're more advanced. Huh? We're beyond this uh, preliminary stage. We're we're in the final stage. We can realize the oneness of everything. But no, no they can't really. Huh? I had one guy telling me the other day, all I see is oneness. Everywhere I look, there is only Brahman. <laughs> Not realizing that his very words give away the fact that he sees a difference between himself and Brahman. Like he is the observer and Brahman is the observed. He is the subject and Brahman is the object. That's duality, kid. Huh? Here's a nickel. Get yourself some real realization. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to be sarcastic to cut through people's egotism and their, their false uh, renunciation and their false realizations, which are only rationalizations of their own incompetence. Now, the reason why I think it's important to bring this up, huh? now I could just be diplomatic and let it all pass, right? 
And that's what a lot of people would expect a self-realized person to do. But maybe I'm more compassionate than that. Maybe I don't want you to waste your whole life in useless meditations on a false platform. Maybe you're just looking for a shortcut and there isn't any shortcut. Maybe you can't huh, have sense enjoyment and material attachment and material activities on one hand and still attain self-realization and complete detachment on the other. Maybe it's just not possible. Maybe you have to get real and buckle down and actually do some serious sadhana, some serious meditation, like, I mean, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Huh? And find out what it's really all about. Otherwise, I mean, I meet people all the time here in, in Tierra of Anomaly who say, yes, I've been meditating for years. Well, then are you enlightened? Uh, well, I'm not working on it. No, no, no. If you really knew this, this Advaita philosophy, you could become enlightened in a few days, huh? a few weeks at the most. It's not that difficult if you have right view. So my point is they have never got right view. And so their meditation isn't working. Look, I know people who've meditated for decades and they're still on the psychological platform, the emotional platform, dealing with their childhood traumas and stuff like this. Come on. If you really knew what you were doing, you'd become enlightened right now. Just by a change in viewpoint. That's all it takes. Ramana Maharshi was famous <laughs> for saying, self is already realized. And some people would say, oh, please help me. I can't get realized. I can't meditate, blah, 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 woe is me. And he would say, do you exist? And they would say, well, yeah, of course I exist. Then you're realized. Because self-awareness, huh? consciousness of consciousness is the symptom of Brahman. But because they don't know and they keep up desires and they keep up attachments, they have to think to themselves, oh, I'm actually not enlightened. I'm actually still not liberated. I'm actually bound. I'm not free. And so they miss. And my point is, you can go on missing for the rest of your life. So get the foundation. Get right view, and then the rest of it will come automatically, simply hearing the nice narrations and stories in Yoga Vasishta. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chala Shivam Yidam